Good afternoon and welcome at this knowledge sharing event at Eindhoven at Microcentrum in together uh, working with knowledge sharing event. Today it's about manufacturing technologies and especially about surface technologies and of course there's a fine presentation done by uh, Matti Weiner from Alberts, a company you will learn to know this afternoon more and specifically. And uh, this sh center is about sharing knowledge with all of you in order to improve your competences and your performances in your daily work. Uh, first, let's go to our agenda and let's uh, see who's talking today. You met me already a couple of seconds. I'm Matthias Scherf from Microcentrum. I'm your host for today. And today our speaker is Matti Weiner from Alberts Surface Technologies where he's technology manager. So first let's see and meet who is Matti Weinen. Matti, are you there? Okay, we can hear Matti. Mat we have a small... Sorry. Couple. Okay, Matti, you have... Okay, welcome Matti this afternoon at this... Uh, sorry. Event. Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, Matti, we talked to you and at home, and you are going to present from home because you have bad luck. You have been tested positive in COVID, and but you feel well, I and Zoom. Yeah, yeah, no problems, no problems at all. The only thing is, I may not leave the home, uh, the house, and so I'm bound to uh, the the kitchen table uh, at this moment. Okay, okay. Anyhow, welcome. And finally, you want to, going to present the company, your technologies this afternoon about surface treatments. Uh, but maybe first of all, who is Matti Weinen? I can imagine that when you went to school, when you were very young that you didn't have the idea to become chief technology at a company like today. Uh, no. How was this past from your career? What happened? Ah, that's uh, you're completely right. Uh, it was not my dream uh, job for which I uh, went to school. No, I uh, went to school. Uh, my, my parents had a, an own company in grinding and polishing. And I'm the oldest of four sons. So after I had the mid school finished, it was quite normally I go into the company and take over uh, of have the plan to take it over in the future. What uh, kind of company was that? It was a grinding and polishing company. So, okay. so we uh, make not, uh, steel products nicer by grinding them, by polishing them, and mm -hmm. then they were, plate, they were plated afterwards. So uh, I went there, I, I, I started there, started there, we, we had seven people working, but in, yeah, after a few a few years, I came to the conclusion there's not a job I like to uh, go old in and uh, have to find something else. So what I did was I uh, started uh, studying in the evening to uh, a medical uh, direction, medical analyze to work later on in a, in a hospital. Uh, finished that, and in the meantime, the company of my father went down and down, and at the last moment it it went broke. So I had to find something else. Uh, in that moment, I tried to find work in a hospital, but uh, a lot of unemployment uh, couldn't get get in. So what I did is I, I didn't want to stay home. So I went working at a plating company, just as a plating and under parts, just plate the parts myself. And in that moment, I discovered I had, it looked like I had a talent for that because uh, everything I do, I understood it. I could start immediately. I, I did some all the courses which were given in Holland. I followed uh, in the evening to to get uh, to get all the knowledge which was present. And but in that, 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 about the talent, Matty, is that something you discovered yourself, or were you discovered by somebody else? No, no, I discovered that myself. It, it's, uh, it came so easily to me. I understand every move I made there, and just like a football player can. Uh, knows when he is he knows how to play football very well i know how to do this uh, very well so that's uh, that was a, a fortune for me and uh, in that case i i in a few years i became from working on the bars over quality engineer a quality manager a chemistry manager i became the production manager there and uh, from that point on i developed further and further in the company I worked at, uh, as, a, as a company manager in, uh, in, in the same company here. I did, uh, went to our, in, now I have to tell others, in 1990, we were bought by Albert's Industries as, a, as its seventh company. And in the 2000 years, they, in 2000, they joined us together with the German group, German group of platers. 
and the German group of platers were 20 companies which only were uh, plating, plating facilities. And there I took over the R&D for the complete group. So I was manager so, of the R&D group there. So you're actually working at a huge company. What yeah, about the yeah. size today? Uh, yeah, the size today is, I think, we're just about over the 150 companies, uh, one and a half billion of uh, turnover. So it's, it's a very big company, big player, uh, big player in, the, in the field, especially directed in the technical, techn technology, uh, technology uh, directions of, of the world. Because your profession, if you're talking about surface treatment in, in a wide range, yeah. it's not something you just can learn in a school or university. You, you have a lot of competence and knowledge built up by working years and years and years. So yeah. a lot of insight is required to, to, to do your job. And I understood in a couple of years you're going to be retired. Yeah, is that a problem, problem for Albus, or are you copy pasting yourself in a way? No, no, no. Uh, I, I, I'm also doing some R and D, but that I didn't succeed. Succeeded in that. But uh, what I'm doing is, and I started already a year or six, seven ago. I gathered some young people who were, had a good drive in the company, uh, who were interested, had a good uh, knowledge of what they are doing, and I start training them. Uh, I do that now five or six years. Uh, we have technology, we have uh, theoretical courses. Uh, we have also practical uh, meetings and very slowly they get on the point in which I can say, okay, when I go, when I retire, I have two, uh, at least two people there who will take over the job and are just as fresh as I started out and will live. Yeah will gather the experience over the coming years. So, so knowledge um, sharing is not new to you. I, we've understood you are a teacher at Mikro Centrum. Yes, yes, we have in the Mikro Centrum, we have uh, with two colleagues, we have a, a really interesting uh, course of three days, modern surface treatment. And uh, in that course, we can go much deeper. That's what we are trying to do this afternoon. Uh, we want to, to talk about the surface treatments. We want to uh, talk about the how the designers can work with surface treatment, mm -hmm. but one and a half hours, a little bit too short to explain <laughs> that. Also, we have to go in in a, in a real big pace, a taste over, over the the parts. But I will try to explain as much as possible. And if there are other interests, they can always follow the other courses. No problem. Okay, okay. So now we have met a little bit who is Matti Weiner and I hope that uh, helps people to understand from what kind of position you're talking in your presentation. Uh, the presentation will be in two parts uh, and split up a small couple of questions and a kind of test for the audience to test themselves in how they feel about technology and how far they are developing themselves. You can judge them then a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and at the end of this uh, whole program, there will be also questions and answers, of course, and something else I will announce you at the end of this program. Okay. So for now, I think it's time, Matti, that we are going to listen to your presentation. So let's okay. go for it. Um, and we are going to start the presentation on the location of Matti Weiner. So now and then we have to switch a little bit between technologies and buttons and screens and Zoom sessions. But we hope it's going to be all fine. We do our best. Matti, good luck with your first part of your presentation. Thank you very much. Something went wrong. This and this. So it's there. Yes, you're yep. happy. Yep, we see okay. it. Okay. okay. Good. Good luck. We have, thank you very much. I have something in my screen, which I have to diminish. Yes. Good. Yeah. Uh, my presentation is called Discover the Design Rules and Characteristics of Electrolytic and Chemical Plating. Uh, just as I told, uh, I only have limited time for tell you everything. So we try to, to overview uh, some topics which I think um, are interesting and which we, is very narrow to us because we're doing these, these uh, teams ourselves. Um, questions and for deeping, 
uh, going in deeper is always possible in the later part. Okay, uh, the first question which raised to me was, uh, please put in a sheet all the surface treatments which are possible so that we can make a choice. Now, I, I talked about that and I thought about that, and how can I do that? And came very quickly to the conclusion that it's not possible. Uh, what as you see here is a screen and these are only the processes, the, the, the process we do at other industries. Uh, the surface treatment, sorry. So that's a group of companies. Uh, and I think we talk about 60 or 70 companies of the whole group who are doing surface treatment. And if you look at them, these are the surface treatments of only this group. And I don't talk about adding co uh, other uh, com uh, competitors or so, so, just like body code or so uh, like this. They also have this kind of uh, mass amount of different coatings. So it's impossible to look at all those coatings and to, to put them on one sheet. Uh, what I did was, I um, believe I had underneath, I wrote down the Albert's Estate Com. That's the site in which you can see all these processes and what's the other, what we're doing there. And I also gave uh, to, uh, to the people of uh, KC the, the PDFs of this. So you can look at them if you want. So all those uh, coatings are here mentioned, but they're only done by other surface treatment. And there are a lot of more of those coatings. So what I did was I took out the coatings which we're doing in our site in Eindhoven. And that's where the coatings also I want to talk about. Uh, we talk about electrolytic plating. That's what we do. We do nickel plating. Uh, then a special nickel process, not the, the, the right process for which is used for the, the chair and the furniture industry, but the special technical uh, processes. We do tin plating, we do silver plating, uh, copper, gold, and some alloy plating, uh, which is down below. Other thing is what we do here in Eindhoven is chemical plating. We do several chemical nickel processes, and the chemical nickel processes which are done uh, at our place are, is called DNC 520. That's, that's a, a brand name, which is often used for, for those chemical nickel processes. And we do some special process. Press processes are dispersion coatings with silicon carbide and uh, coatings in which we infuse our chemical nickel with po uh, polymers. As another type of coatings which we do is, and that are more special coatings, is etching of titanium, etching copper, uh, passivating, and we have some glass beading, aluminium bleeding, and aluminium oxide blasting, and clean room packaging. What I want to talk about is, in principle, the next, the following things. I want first, I want to address the pretreatment of coatings. And um, you think that pretreatment is that something what we have to know? Yes, I think you have to know that because uh, the start of a part is how it's delivered to us. And that delivering, uh, that uh, the pretreatment is when a part is delivered, we have to treat it. Everyone is thinking that plating, that's uh, uh, dipping in the bath, and okay, it's, it's ready. But it's not dipping in one bath. We have a complete a section of parts necessary for pre-treat, pre-treat with your parts and to give them the right coating. The second thing I want to talk about is the difference between the three coating, uh, coating items. And in this case, we're talking then over the electrolytic and electrochemical coatings. You have the electrolytic plating, that's plating with the current, the chemical plating, coatings like chemical nickel, and conversion coatings is coatings which you change the material itself, which is uh, but the material say, still stays on. Then I go deeper into the electrolytic plating. I go deeper in the chemical plating. I will talk a little bit of the chemical plating of dispersion coatings. And last but not least, I will talk about on plating rules, especially for designers and developers. It's important to know these things because uh, what, what do I have to take in account when I'm thinking of making a new part, when I later on want to plate it, or with what kind of coding I should plate. 
pre-treatment. First pre-treatment, that's, that's a section where, uh, where everyone says uh, you have to take that in your presentation. And, and what I just said, yes. Uh, if you talk about pre-treatment, what we want to have is you, you design a part or you want to have a, have a part and you want to have coded with a nickel layer or a tin layer or something. It doesn't matter what you have to have put a coating on. The important thing is, of course, that that coating which you put on is adherent to the layer because it's uh, disastrous if you have a part, you have coated it, you have built it in, and then come to the conclusion, hey, the coating which is on comes loose or something like that. That well, gives you a lot of problems, of course, with your customer. So what, you, what we have to do is we make sure that the coating which we apply to a metal is good of a good adhesion. And you do that by using the uh, natural way of metallic bonding. That means if you look at a part and you look at, look at metal, then you will notice that the metal, uh, the parts, the metal are built in crystals. If, if you uh, divide a part in, in small sections and you could look at them, you would see that all, everything of metal is built out of crystals. Crystals are a group of atoms, uh, very close uh, ranked to each other. And if you go to the atomium in Brussels, you would see uh, the iron, an uh, iron crystal. Uh, the atomium there, you would see that that's an iron crystal. And you see, in principle, what I mean. I think everyone can imagine that. And this, that bonding of those crystals that they are held together is due to the fact that an atom, an atom has electrons around this, uh, this core. And in the outer ring of the uh, atom, there's, there are only a few electrons there. And due to the fact that these electrons uh, are free, uh, they call them free electrons, free movement electrons, they're capable of uh, working together with other atoms. That means those free electrons keep the atoms together. That's happening in a crystal, in solid material. If you now go to uh, plating, you put another metal on these materials. Once you want to have a very good adhesion, you have to make sure for one thing, is that if you put, and you see that on the right one, the right side of the, the presentation, you see the atoms, and there you see those small free electrons moving around those atoms. If I put a nickel layer on them, to have a good adhesion, I have to make sure that these electrons, which are moving around my steel atoms, also make those movements around my nickel atoms. And if they do that for, say, 50 or 60 percent, you have a per perfect adhesion of your nickel layer with your steel because you get a metal bonding. You make a part or you the part is uh, produced. And what you do with that part when it's produced, you use oil, grease, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you leave your parts uh, in, in, in the expedition. And what happens, it starts to grow a little bit. Or you heat treat them or weld them or something like that. You create oxides. If you look at the right uh, friction, you see that when in between the steel and the nickel, there is oil or oxides, the electrons can move from steel to nickel and from nickel to steel back. So the adhesion is prohibited. This piece of adhesion, what you see there, oil and oxides, is devastating, devastating for the adhesion. And it has to be removed. And that is what you do when you pre-treat. And if you see on the bottom of the part, uh, on the bottom picture, you see, sorry, I have to go back. You see that adhesion is not that common. And you see a bad adhesion, you see this kind of phenomenons. You see there are those blisters, small blisters, just where there's no adhesion, probably due to oil, grease, or other oxides. To do this, you have to pre-treat your part. And that's what I meant with uh, the, the pre-treatment as itself. It's not only one part in which you play your part. No, you need a section of parts 
to make your part played. And if you look at the right picture, you see, uh, see a, an immense amount of bats. Say, eh? I think I'll be talking about 20 or 24 of these bats, and only two or three bats are really made just for plating, and that bat is plated. The rest of the bats are made out of pretreatment sections and rinsing sections. This means also for the developers and for the the, the guys who think about how. To, to, to make parts, to invent, to think how can I make a part, they have to take an account that I can put a part in a bot, but I have to know that all these, the, when, for instance, you have a very big part. You, you call a plate and say, okay, we have a part with these sizes. Do you have a tank for that? And he probably say, yes, I have a tank for that for the part that will fit. But take an account that you don't need one part, uh, one bot, you need a complete section of bots to make sure that the part is plated. That's something you have to remind. When you start plating, and that's on the left side of the slide, you see what you need is first you have to take off all the oil and grease. Eh? By grinding and milling and all that kind of stuff that you do to the materials. You get a lot of oil and fat on your parts and you have to clean that. Now, normally that's done with alkaline cleaning. They take off the oil and the grease. Uh, you do a deep cleaning, uh, it's done electrolytically, you then gas the valves on the parts and they'll take off all the pores, they'll clean all out the pores. And so you re re really, if you clean uh, your parts of the oil and the grease, the second uh, step you do is to pickle. You have to remove your oxides, yeah, and you do that with acids, uh, and just like hydrochloric acids, or in case of aluminum, you use nitric acid, that kind of stuff, is to remove all oxides, all metallic company, company contaminations and, your rust, and rust. After that, you have to activate them again. And quite easy, uh, the normal steel metals, it's not difficult. Yeah? You, you use a, a very diluted uh, acid for that. But if you have to go to higher uh, alloyed steels like stainless steels or even higher high nickel uh, uh, alloys, you have to make special, uh, special activation treatments, just like nickel strike or something like that. And for aluminium, you need a complete, totally different pre-treatment, you need a zincate. And for magnesium, you need another treatment. So it's complete plating is not just that one bath. No, it's a, a series of baths which you need to first clean your parts, which is the most important step to get an adhesive layer on your parts, which you want to deliver to your customer. Now, well, which metals can we plate? Now, we have the metals, which you see on the left side, uh, the, the steels, the copper, the nickel, the stainless steels, the aluminium and titanium. Uh, the black, the, uh, which are made darker black, are the metals which we do standard in, uh, in, in Eindhoven. Uh, we clean them, we have the right pretreatment for them. And uh, under there, there are the more rare metals like molybdene, tungsten, tantalum, carbon, or other metals uh, are also metals which we can plate but not do uh, in, in sale production, but more when they are necessary. But the first uh, six, which I mentioned here, are the most important uh, metals which has to be placed. And I, when I talk about steel, I talk about all the steel alloys uh, which can be plated. Another uh, advantage is it's always possible to replate these, these metals. So it means if you put the plating on it, uh, if you put nickel on it or you put zinc on it, it's always possible to take off the coating and put on the coating again. That's something which is in plating, uh, luckily, good done. On the right side is something which you have to be aware of because we can't plate all the metals, uh, which you have on the left side. But uh, one risk here, one uh, dangerous thing, which you see here on the right side. 
And that is when you plate uh, a, a metal, you have to take into account his, um, yeah, let's say, his potential. When we know that we have, for instance, zinc, and we want to play that, and we play that, and if you look at that on, on the right side, on the below, on the picture below, and we played that, uh, we played cop put copper on that, then you will notice that copper is, in principle, and you see that in the electro in the, the galvanic series, you see that copper has a nobler material. It has a positive charge of 0.52. Steel, however, has a negative series, 0.44. This difference is in principle the same as a battery. That means that if you put copper in contact with iron, iron will dissolve and copper will be the cathodic element. So if I put copper on steel, what I've done on the blow side, and there's a hole in the coat, and there's a pore or something like that, and there's a solution there, you will get due to the fact that iron will dissolve in preference for the copper, will form iron oxide. You get rust on your part. If you put zinc on steel, and you see zinc is a more uh, unnoble material, opo, minus 0 0.67 against 0 0.44 from the iron, means that zinc is not, the iron will not corrode here, but the zinc will grow because zinc is more unnoble and the zinc will protect the st uh, steel from corrosion. Now, that's also one of the things which is, is where you have taken account. So if you take, for instance, aluminum, and you want to gold plate that, you have to take an account that if you have a pore between uh, the two coatings and, the can, and it's in a humid environment, you will have a battery of far, more than three volts, and you will see your aluminum corrodes where you stand, when you look at it. So that's things which you have to take into account. Use the right coating on the right material, or make sure that the coating which you bring on is thick enough so it's closed. Now, we have three kinds of coatings, three kinds of co group, groups of coatings. First, you have the electrolytic surface treatment. And electrolytic surface treatment is a treatment uh, which is the most common treatment uh, when you talk about uh, elect uh, when you talk about plating, and by means of an electro current, uh, electrolyzes and adhesive layer metal, metal layer is applied to the electric conduct of object commonly made from a metal. That means you have uh, a product, and the product is uh, due to an electric process covered with another metal. To do this, you have to completely immersed the object in a suitable liquid. And uh, just as I told you in the beginning, uh, you have to put your part in a bath. That means if you design a product, be aware that it has to fit into a, in a tank which the solution is containable. So if you think, okay, uh, I can make my part as big as the Eiffel Tower, you have to take into account that you have to find a plate which has a bath which is just as big where the Eiffel Tower and fits. Now, you know, that's impossible. So, but that's something taken, uh, we have to take in mind. And what here uh, valuable is, is if when you say, okay, know what I'm doing, I make the, for instance, a big part in two or three uh, pieces, three sections, and combine them afterwards because I can plate them then. The object, uh, the part, is connected to a power source, source. That's what you have with electric surface treatment. That's why you get that electrolytic process. And the metals you can put on the object are depending on the galvanic potential. I'll come back to that soon. And examples, the most known examples, of course, are zinc, nickel, chrome, copper, tin, gold, and silver. That electro window, so, so saying, okay, which metals can be plated is what you see here on the left side. Uh, here you got the galvanic series again, and you will see that gold, silver goes down until aluminum. And from these metals, you can see on the right side, as we call it, electrochemical window of water-based electrolytes. 
you see that the electrolytes until so one volt, chrome, zinc, manganium, are still platable out of water-based electrolytes. Everything below that, materials like aluminum, titanium, uh, zirconium, magnesium, uh, if you call them, you can't play them out of water-based electrolytes due to the fact that they oxidize so quickly that even in the solutions they oxidize. So you, you don't get a, a metal uh, plated on the part. Comes a question, is that an absolute impossible to plate, for instance, aluminum on a steel plate? No, it can be done, but it has to be done in ionic liquids. Ionic liquids are um, salts, ionic salts, low melting salts, in which you can uh, plate from, out, from the aluminum from outer salt, but you may not use any water and you have to stay away from every oxide. That means you have to work on an inert gas or some uh, environment. Uh, it is possible, but it's not really feasible. It's not done very often. Then you look, here you see on the left side, you see uh, a plating belt, an electrolytic plating belt, uh, to say right. And here you see in principle the, the, the principles of that belt. On the right sides of the tank, you see the anodes and the anodes, these bars. In these anodes, the metal which you want to plate is uh, kept here. That means that if I want to plate nickel, I have nickel on the both sides of those bars, all of those bars. On both sides, the, uh, the baskets are filled with nickel. If I want to play zinc, the baskets are filled with zinc. If I want to play tin, the baskets are filled with tin. Then in the middle, you have the electrolyte. And the electrolyte contains, in principle, two things. First, it contains the metal dissolved, the ions of the metal which you want to plate because otherwise it takes too long to dissolve on the anode and go to the cathode. So the ions in there, metal ions. So if you have nickel, you want the nickel plate, you have nickel ions. If you have tin, you have tin ions. And they contain an anion, which is dissolving the nickel metal on the anodes. That means that you have two, um, a minimum of two chemicals into the bath and you have the metal on these sides. In the middle, you have an opening in which you can hang a bar, and on that bar, your parts are hanged for the plate. Now, seeing this, you know what I mean when I say, okay, if you want to plate something, it has to fit in your bar. Uh, it has to fit between the anodes, it has to fit in the length of the bar, and it has to fit in the depth of the bar. So that's something what in designing always has to be in, in, in your mind if you want to plate it afterwards. Now, the common metals used in the electroplating, of course, zinc, uh, special for corrosion uh, resistance. Corrosion resistance uh, I think zinc is the most applied coating uh, of the world, over the world, and um, uh, due to that corrosion uh, issue. Then you do nickel, uh, chromium. Chromium is uh, used especially in the decorative industry uh, as, as a top layer on nickel to make sure that your parts are nice and stay nice. And you have, of course, tin, copper, silver, and gold. And then you have common alloys, uh, tin, nickel, nickel, tungsten, white bronze, brass, and bronze. The red ones is something which we're doing in Eindhoven. The black ones, we don't. Other companies of other industries do some zinc plating, but chromium and brass and bronze are not done in our group. We are not really working in the decorative industry. The second group is the chemical surface treatment. And by chemical surface treatment is that you, by means of a chemical reaction induced by the immersed object, a welded here metal layer is applied to the metal object. That means that when I put, I have a bath, I have a tank, the tank is filled with the solution. I take my part, I put my part into the bath, and that part starts a reaction, a chemical reaction in the bath. And due to that reaction, the nickel or silver or copper is plated onto the part itself. Also here, you have to completely immerse the object in a suitable liquid. 
That means you have to put it in a bath in a tank with the solution. The object here is not connected to a power source. This process is current free. That means you don't have any electric uh, connections on the outside. Uh, you only work on chemistry. That means that uh, you can do it in principle everywhere. You can put uh, a beaker in your kitchen and you can play with chemical, uh, chemical surface treatment. The chemistry which you need here always contains a reducing agent. That means there's always, uh, because your metal is dissolved in the solution, you have to have uh, electrons delivered to get your ions, uh, which are uh, metal two plus ions, which means they miss electrons to make sure that those electrons go from metal ions to metal meta uh, metallic uh, parts. And known examples are uh, nickel, copper, gold, and silver, and the best known, of course, is chemical nickel. And I think that most of the companies, most of the people who are listening, know this process <coughs> that it's done. When you look at the chemical nickel bar, you see also what I mean. You see there are bars enough, of course, but you don't see any anodes on the sides and you don't see any connection for current in the middle of the tank. Uh, it's just a tank which has uh, a high temperature. You see the, the damp evolving, but uh, otherwise you don't need any current. That's chemical no processes uh, are there. No. You have the chemical process like uh, high phosphorus, mid phosphorus, low phosphorus. That means that these process have an, an amount of phosphorus in it, which is in the first case high, middle, and low. Then you have chemical nickel with PTV dispersion, so that PTV is in the coating. You have PTV impregnation, better known as NEDOX, in which you apply PTV afterwards in the coating. And you have chemical nickel with silicon dispersion, silicon small particles and silicon big particles, silicon nine. You have some other chemical processes, uh, but they're not so well known in the print industry. You see a lot of copper. Uh, in the early days, you saw a lot of gold. Um, gold is still applied in some processes, and silver is, although you wouldn't expect it, you look at it every day. Uh, with that, I mean, if you go in the morning, you go to the bathroom and you look at your mirror, you think, oh, I look horrible. Uh, you don't look at, at, at the, you don't look at yourself. You look in principle at a glass plate behind, uh, behind there is a thin, thin silver layer, which reflects so that you can see your face yourself. Chemical nickel plate. Chemical nickel plating is uh, the most known chemical process. And uh, it's, it's known on a lot of names. And I just listed out these names due to the fact that uh, everyone knows we're talking in principle always over the same process. It's called as nickel fog, NEP. It's autocatalytic nickel, which is the right name for it. Electroless nickel, uh, nickel phosphor, chemical, dirty coat. Uh, to last our uh, brand names, but we all talk here about chemical nickel. Then the third group are the conversion coatings. Uh, conversion <coughs> coatings are a little bit different coatings because uh, here you form your layer on a totally different uh, manner. Uh, you, when you, by means of the, the description is by means of this solution from the material of the object itself and the chemical re reaction of this with the liquid of the process, a layer is formed in the object with different properties than the object itself. What I mean here is you, uh, you do your part also completely immersed in the liquid, but when you put your part in that liquid, your part is dissolved on the top. That dissolved material, say it aluminum, that material what is dissolved and it is uh, when it is aluminum can go on can go have a reaction with a salt with each in the food uh, solution itself, and then they form a salt and that salt is a layer which is formed on the part. Think about chromating. When you chromate, you put your part in a, in an acid solution, your aluminum part. 
your aluminium is dissolved, the chrome salt is reacted with the aluminium and forms aluminium chromate on your product. And that's a totally different process. Also here, you completely emerge your part in, uh, in the liquid. It's not always connected to a power source. I'll come to that a little bit later. And the chemistry required for this always contains a metal dissolving agent. Uh, you have to dissolve your metal on the outside and, a and an element which is in the fluid solution which forms a layer. Uh, examples are chromating, chromating, sorry, chromating, phosphating, and anodizing. And that's a big mistake what everyone thinks. Everyone thinks that anodizing is an electrolytic process. Yeah, you use an electrolytic help of it, but it's a conversion process. Looking at uh, the forming of those chromate layers of the chromate conversion coating, see here on this picture what happens. You have the aluminum. The aluminum is uh, dissolved as put under in an, an, an acidly solution. The aluminum goes over in aluminum three plus. The aluminum three plus goes connect with the chrome in the bath and forms a chrome aluminum coating with layer which is on your product. It's a part of your. Same kind when you look at anodizing. Uh, anodizing, uh, it's not, as I said, not an electric process, but with electrolytic help, we form an aluminum oxide layer. We use the aluminum of the part itself and we, we uh, put it in, uh, in, in, the, in the, the tank. When it's in the tank, it's dissolved. Uh, it's, uh, the tank contains mostly of sulfuric acid. The aluminum is dissolving on the surface. And due to forming of oxide, aluminum oxide is formed and builds up onto the material. And what you see is that all the aluminum oxide layers, the anodizing layers, are formed out of the material itself. And that's why it's a conversion coating. Now, conversion coatings, uh, anodizing processes, chromating processes, phosphating processes, uh, chemical, chemical blackening process, and Passivation process, because also stainless steel passivating of stainless steel is uh, a, a conversion code. Because what you do is you make a, uh, you make sure that your chrome in your stainless steel makes a uh, reaction with oxides of the air and forms chrome oxide. And that chrome oxide, which is on the surface of your part, will protect your part from corrosion. And that's Preservation of stainless steel. Uh, for going into the electrolytic plating and electroplating, I for what I did is I choose several coatings to explain. Uh, I first start with electrolytic plating. I will talk about electrolytic nickel, electrolytic tin, electrolytic silver. For the chemical plating, I will do chemical nickel. And for the various treatments, I do other metals and alloys and HM passivating. But first for that, we will go back to the, to the organization and we do the mint, uh, I believe. Yeah. Well, thank you, Matthias, so far. Uh, yeah. Maybe another question, because uh, we have split up the, the session between Nico Centrum and your private location, yeah. your home. You brought to us a couple of products. Maybe there are some of these parts you want to also to mention something about for the They come in the second, uh, the they second, second part. Second part. Okay. I, I didn't forget it. I, I didn't, didn't forget it. Okay, right. Then we continue, uh, dear audience, with our Mentimeter session, which means that you are going to be active now as well. Um, as you can see on your screen, um, there is some action required from your site. You can go to a site called Mentimeter, but as you can see, there is also a QR mark. Uh, at this uh, sheet and the most simple way to uh, link up is just use it I'll show you with my phone pick up your phone and you're right away you are in the Mentimeter session where you get a question you can input by text all kind of ideas you have about it alternative ways that you go to the site mentimeter.com and use the code you see displayed in the screen 
most convenient way is use your phone and your QR code and scan it and you are right away in the first question. What will happen is if you put in your text, and please do that all of you, you will build up automatically kind of word cloud with all kind of reactions, response from your side, and Matthew will again respond to what you filled up in this question form. So let's wait for that for a couple of seconds and then see what is going to happen on the screen. While doing that, Mati, until now, you have explained a lot of different kind of technologies, yeah. which means that your profession is really a technology job. It's not yeah. something easy to do. You need insights. Um, there are also questions by the audience. We will answer a couple of them later on in the program, and the rest we will answer by the website. One question on my side is, uh, you were talking about this Eiffel Tower and above. Yeah. That, that, that triggered me. Uh, but is there, because of the uh, mechanism of the process, a limitation to the bath until it doesn't work anymore? Would a bath of the size of a football field work anyhow? Or are the distances too long between electronics and the bath chemicals to do that job? No, the, the, uh, the principle, the theory principle of an electroplating bath will work even if it's as big as a football field. Okay. Uh, so th that's possible because it's 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 bound by uh, normal uh, uh, f physical laws, and it doesn't matter how big it is. The problem is, however, to get that amount of solution <laughs> gathered and and make sure that that solution is in the right movement and this has the right temperature and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But the problem, what I see, is in the in the in the in the future is that. Uh, People are trying to make big things bigger, 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 mm -hmm. and lose in principle and forget about the fact that it has to be treated. And mm -hmm. of course, I can make those bots, but it's not only making one bot that big. I have to make 20 bots that big. Yep. And that's something which is not doable anymore. Yep. And okay. that's why I, I say, could try to look in the beginning of when you design a part, mm -hmm. is it possible to make it out smaller sections? which are treatable. If you don't want to treat it afterwards, no problem. You, 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 there's no, no need for that. But if you want to give them a surface treatment, you take that in care. Okay. Meanwhile, we were talking, uh, you were talking, we see yeah. that uh, reactions on the questions, why should I apply a surface treatment are uh, yeah. entering? And maybe you can read some of them. Maybe please react on them. What do you see as an answer on the, on the why question? Why should you apply a surface treatment? What do you think about the answers? Yeah, you see, and that's why I also said in my beginning, uh, you can't make a complete, complete overview of all the code in which are happening. Because if you see what's written here, you see so much different reasons to apply a surface treatment. For every surface treatment, you need another type of process. Mm -hmm. So if you, and every type of process you can put on different methods, but you need with different pre treatments. So it's such a big world, a, a big uh, uh, environment which you want to uh, work at, that it's almost impossible to give everything what he wants. So what you do mostly is you uh, look for uh, combinations. For instance, you say, okay, I need corrosion resistance, uh, but perhaps I need also appearance. And what you then get is what's now known as, for instance, nickel chrome coatings. And uh, nickel chrome coatings are coatings which are used on the furniture and uh, in the early days at cars, at least in my early days uh, at cars. Uh, you saw those more nice shiny uh, bumpers uh, of the cars, uh, really bright. Now, they're nickel plated just for the corrosion resistance, very thick layers, highly bright and then coat it with a small chromium, a very thin chromium layer to make sure that the nickel which is on is bright, is hard, won't, is real resistant, so it won't damage when you use it, and you combine those things. So okay. there's a lot of things to do, but you always, yeah, with the vast amount of different possible coatings, it's very difficult to say, okay, we do this and we do that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, our next question is about, uh, have some insights for you on the level of knowledge in the audience. Let's go to the second uh, question. What is your knowledge about surface treatments? Just be honest, it's not gonna judge you. It's just to have an idea about how in our audience the level of knowledge is ranked. And maybe we can deliver something out of that. 
let's see what happens. Okay. The first reactions are entering. As you can see, it's complete interactive. It's mm -hmm. live. Yeah. Now people are modest because they don't see excellent at the moment. The one small line, I don't know if that's in the good link. No, it's just a bar. Okay. Well, maybe we can respond to that as well, uh, Matthew, for the moment. You see that the, by far the most are fair, uh, yeah. choosing fair, then poor, and then good. Um, is that also your impression when you talk to customers, to colleagues in the field about yes. the level of knowledge about surface treatments? Yes, the, <coughs> especially uh, the, the knowledge is, is not a big, this is logical because uh, schools don't uh, do anything that uh, you can't, can't study it, you can't learn it. Uh, I know there's not that much attention for uh, surface treatment. Uh, and everyone, but everyone forgets that almost everything, when you look around you, almost everything has a surface treatment. Mm -hmm. And without surface treatment, we won't have any corrosion resistance, we won't have any rear resistance. Uh, uh, you don't have any uh, good conductivity, you know, contact resistance, all that kind of stuff. You don't have, if you didn't have uh, the knowledge of surface three of, of surface treatments. So I know it's it's fair, and uh, that yeah, reassures me a little bit because those people know at least what uh, they're doing, uh, and I know that I, we have to do work, and I think the microcenter could do a lot of thing there to make sure that the poor goes over in fair. Okay, so knowledge sharing center is important. Yeah. That's why we are doing this today, together with you and a lot of other companies and people. Sharing knowledge is important to improve this level that, let's say between now and two years, that this bar of excellent is swapped by, by fair. Yeah, yeah, and it's not only for uh, for the people itself or for the companies for the world, but it's for, for the general good, eh? because if we don't, if you know about the codings, you can apply the right codings, you can apply them on the right way, and you, uh, you have less failures uh, to expect, and less failures means less chemical uses, so this or everything together. Maybe a last question before you go to the second part of your presentation. If, if this whole lineup would change in a lot of Excel excellent. Yeah. What would that mean for the competitiveness of the companies who apply surface treatments? That would be great. That would be great. Because if you know how much time uh, our competitors, uh, competitors and colleagues, uh, must I say, uh, have to convince customers, uh, you better do this or you better do mm -hmm. that. Or, uh, yeah, now we have a problem because the part is corroded at our customer or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could... Uh, could prohibit that and we get a customer who says hey we need nickel plating because we use it for that then that with that coding thickness yeah you make less faults and life would be much easier okay there's a bright future in front of us yeah. well then we are in the program at the part that you are going to start with the second part of your program uh, good luck with that of course yours again Matty. yeah thank you okay Yeah. yeah, here it is. Okay. Good. Uh, so I'm I'm running over these these further codes which I mentioned here. Uh, nice if he now, uh, going back to the electroplating, first a little bit now how, how it works. Yeah. In principle, you see here on the, on the right side, you see uh, a, a drawing of, of, uh, of a bot, a sketch of a bot. And what I wrote down is that you hear is in that tank, you have, of course, the electrolyte, and that contains the metal ions. In the middle of the part, on the cathode, you hang your part, and on the sides of the tank, you have your anodes, the metal which 
has to be dissolved and which is you're going to play on your cat, on your part. What you do is said, how does it work? You connect the anodes and the cathodes with a rectifier. The rectifier is a, is a device which gives you a DC current, so current in one direction. When you switch off your DC current, you have that current between your anode and cathode, and you will create a flow of electrons from the anode to the cathode. That means that the anode electrons are disappearing and means that uh, electrons are negative, that the anode will be positively charged. The electrons which go to the cathode will make sure that you get an overflow of, of electrons on your part that will make your part negative. So your cathode, your part is negatively charged. The anode is positive, the cathode is negative. Then the metal ions, which are dissolved in the blood, which have a positive charge, uh, a metal ion is a positive charge, will of course move to a negative charge. Uh, plus and minus are attracting each other. That means that the metals into the, in the electrolyte will move to the cathode. Coming to the cathode, they will pick up the electrons which are in overflow there, and the electrons will make sure that the ions go over in a metal. So metal is formed around the cathode. The other uh, substance in the bath are the anions, which are negatively charged, will be transferred to the anode because there uh, is a uh, shortage of electrons. The electrons of the anions are transferred and the anions dissolve a little bit of the metal, which is on the anode. What do I get? I get at the cathode, the, pos the position of metal, and sometimes I get hydrogen development, and then the anode, I get dissolution of metal, and sometimes oxygen development. Here is a little bit written when you see what's happening in a nickel bath, and just to clear now a little bit further, a nickel, which is charged positively, the nickel ions move to the cathode, hydrogen ions move to the cathode, and the chloride uh, anions, uh, which are also as ions that have moved to the anode. That means at the cathode, you have nickel, you get on the cathode some hydrogen development, and on the anode, you dissolve nickel. The complete process is, uh, runs on the, the Faraday's law, and that means that the mass of a chemical substance produced an electrode is proportional to the charge transferred in Coulomb, E8 to the number of electrons transferred. In means simple words, uh, you put on a current and the high of the current and the time of your process will deliver the amount of nickel or metal produced. The electroplating has one big disadvantage and that's called the dogbone effect. And that has to do with the following effect. If you look at the part, I'm looking for here. You look at the part which you had on a cathode, and you see it has a little bit of H shaped part, it's the white thing. Then you put that current on it, and what happens is that you get current lines from the anodes uh, plus plus to the cathode. Those electron, oh, this, this, those, those lines, uh, this, this, uh, lines, this current lines, these are running there. The distance determines, of course, the, uh, the speed of the plating. That means that where the lines are the closest to the part, the layer thickness will grow faster than on the, plats, the places where the lines are longer or wider from the part. That means that in the end, you build an eight dog bone effect. The black, you see it, is the dog bone effect. That has to do with the fact that the uh, current lines are not in the bath itself. That's an advantage which you have with electrolytic plate. You can do anything about it. Yeah, you can, can, you can minimize it by, by using helping methods, but in principle, it's a characteristic of the process itself. And to show you that, I have on the right side, we have made some parts. If you look on the drawing, you see uh, a mandrel, a stainless steel mandrel, which is used uh, for forming uh, a model 
of uh, the which must be cast in, in, in plastic. And we plated that with 400 microns. So from the X with the point, it's plated with 4,000 microns of nickel. And there you see that on the ends of the, these parts, you should expect a, a pin, uh, one would see also in the drawing, but you see a rounding. That's in excessive the dog bone effect. So if you want to plate electrolytically on very uh, accurate dimensions, you can forget it. The process won't allow that. And that's one of the biggest disadvantages of the electrolytic plating. Because in principle, it's one of the best processes we have. It's, it's cheap. Um, you don't have to uh, renew these parts. We have parts which are still or more than 20 or 25 years, the same solution in the same tank. And we're still working in that. Uh, so that's, that's of course, uh, yeah, cheap, <laughs> let's say so. So it's a cheap process. So if you're looking for cost-effective plating, you go to uh, electrolytic plate. It gives you a high deposition rate. Uh, you saw those mandals in, 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 in before we take 4,000 uh, microns. Uh, you can plate with the, that nickel process, so 250, 40, 250 microns in an hour, which is a standard layer thickness buildup. It's infinitive lifetime. Uh, what we do is we, we you plate in the bath, uh, your nickel is dissolved from the anode, so that keeps on uh, coming back, so you don't have to do anything about it. The only thing what you drag out or take out is you, you, you drag out uh, when you take parts out of, so you correct that with some chemicals, but for the rest, the bath stays uh, working. You clean it uh, once a year and you can work in it. So we also have no chemical correction rate. Disadvantages, and that's what you see on the on the right side. Uh, you see uh, the first two pictures. You see the layer buildup in the dark colors is on the edges more, is in the deep recessed places less. And if you compare that, to, for instance, with the chemical nickel process, which is on the side, you see that they are not the case. So you have buildup on the layer on the edges. You have external power source. You will always need a rectifier. You have low throwing power and none or little deposit on the recessed places. Then going to <coughs> the in the electrolytic processes, uh, I take the most the three most used processes uh, what, or process which we're doing in, in Eindhoven. Uh, but first, we do the electrolytic nickel plating. No. Electrolytic plating you use is used uh, for the, the, the biggest uh, part, I think, in the decorative industry, nickel and nickel chrome. Uh, everyone knows uh, the IKEA uh, cupboards uh, with the, the hinges, uh, which you see on the right side uh, for furniture and all kind of cupboards. You see it on your ordners, which have those uh, nice, shiny uh, metal clamps on which you put your papers. All that kind of thing is all, all electronic nickel plating. Then is the decorative, in the decorative industry is nickel, also a base layer for chrome. Uh, as I told you, nickel is, uh, can be very shiny. And if you put a very shiny layer onto uh, metals and you put a thin layer of chrome on it, you have a typical layers, which is called in the, in, in the normal, and, uh, hey, we, we do, it's chrome plated, it's not chrome plated, it's nickel chrome plated. Very thick nickel layer, which is more, nice and shiny, very thin chrome layer on the top, which is uh, not seen at that uh, layer thicknesses, but gives you the uh, corrosion protection of the nickel, so the nickel won't discolor, and it makes sure that the nickel isn't damaged due to the fact that chrome is very hard. Another thing is where you see it's a managed machine fan manufacturing for corrosion and wear resistance. And then I mean uh, corrosion uh, when the layer is closed enough, thick enough, that no pores there. 
and wear resistance when not the wear resistance, the hardness is demanded, so the abrasive wear resistance, but more the, the adhesive where the toughness of the layer is demanded. And what we see, and that's something from the, 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 the say the last five to 10 years, you see more and more uh, nickel in the e-mobility, in the electric cars, where it's used for soldering and friction welding. Another application is that it's used as base coatings. Right? It's base coatings in the plating industry, uh, just like that we have for underlayers at chrome, or chrome cores, but also on gold and silver, but also on uh, thermal spray coatings. Uh, the thermal spray coatings are very uh, porous. And uh, to make sure that there's no under corrosion, you put uh, a nickel layer underneath them. Or you see it as repair for machine parts where it replaces chrome, but then that for not for the hardness or so the brace wear resistance, but for the toughness of the adhesive wear resistance. And sometimes it's used for electroforming, just making parts by electroplating. And uh, what you saw with those mandrels, what I showed you, that's in principle a form of electroforming. We make a copy of the mandrel and we the customer is using that for uh, plastic casting the parts in that. I put some on the right side, some, uh, some pictures, uh, the hinge and fasteners, with bright nickel plating. And here are the rollers for the textile industry, base coating for thermal spraying. And then we put on 50 microns, the London microns, smart nickel plating. What do you have? What, what are the properties of, of nickel plating? You can have it in matte till fully bright. Now, the fully bright layers are known, eh? that's the, the nickel chrome and the, the nickel the decorative parts and the nickel things for, for cupboards and that kind of thing, just hinges and so. Uh, the matte parts are more for the technical uh, applications. And what I said on the friction welding, you see on the right side, the picture of these contacts, these contacts, where are the tops are friction welded onto each other. Uh, friction welding is a, is a welding system where you may with very high frequency move the parts over each other without any helping met metals. And the nickel part is, is welded on the nickel part of the other, uh, on the other side. And then you have a very good welding system, which don't cost any uh, extra uh, chemicals to make sure welding takes place. Cable contact for electric parts is used a lot at this moment. Now, the hardness of chemical nickel, of uh, electrolytic nickel, is uh, just about 150 till 450 H hardness fix. That means the hardness, uh, dull nickel is 150, bright nickel is 450. There's a good chemical resistance, uh, nickel itself. It's magnetic. That can be in a trans uh, and can be a, a disadvantage. If it's an advantage, uh, you can use it as a magnetic switch. If it's a disadvantage, you can use it when magnetic switch are in the neighborhood. It's good solderable if you have a matte coating, only then, not when uh, the layers are bright. We are resistant to toughness, I already explained them. And the, four, uh, the advantage of this ductile coating, they have offer matte coating, they're very ductile. That means you can bend in principle that you're coating around uh, an X of, of uh, five or 10 millimeters, and you can bend completely around without getting any, um, I must say, not scratches, but uh, break, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know the English word, sorry. Uh, I come to that. <laughs> uh, good corrosion resistance when the layer is pore free. Um, also explained that eh, the metal nickel is nobler than the steel. That means if there's a pore, the steel will start to corrode and not the nickel itself. So we have to make sure it's pore free. If you can use it at very low temperatures. Uh, the Apollo uh, tanks uh, for the uh, fuel tanks, which are used for the rockets in the, in the 60s and 70s, 
uh, were all made from uh, nickel. It could withstand the temperatures in space. It has layer thickness from, uh, say, half a micron to 5,000 micrometers. It's not allowed in the food industry, and we can put it on every metal. When you put it as a matte nickel, it has very less stress, very uh, low internal stress. When you have fully bright nickel, it has a lot of high stress. On the right side, you also see here break discs, uh, which we did for electric cars, where we put nickel under the thermal spray coat, ceramic spray coat, which is still running at our site in Dern at this moment. Then we look at the next one, that's the tin plating. Now, tin plating is mostly used in the electrical industry for conductivity in the electronic industry for solderability, in the food industry for corrosion resistance, and in the e-mobility, solderability and corrosion resistance. And in the e-mobility is also an upcoming market in which you see it more and more. The advantage of tin is when you solder it, you solder it in the metal itself. That means soldering tin, you melt your metal and you make contact with the melting get solidified again, and that makes you connection with that. That's, a, that's the way in which you uh, can solder tin very good. Uh, electric industry, electronic industries, just for uh, applying, uh, you have to solder on a, some parts. Uh, you can do that very easy. It protects mostly those parts are made from uh, copper, uh, you put tin on them and tin is less noble than copper. That means it protects the copper from oxidizing. So in that case, it's also a good corrosion resistant coating. Sometimes you use it self lubrication and special applications in the silicon. It's used for flow systems. And, when, and what you see here for the, the contacts, it's just a general uh, group of parts, but on the underside, you see here the contact windmill. We use parts for the windmills and they're all templated due to the fact that they have to have contact, but they partially play. This aluminum is still free of template. The properties of the tin coating is uh, also silvery white. It can be also here, it can be matte or bright. Um, this pen, uh, yeah, depending on the kind of uh, uh, applications you need. Now, tin has very low hardness and very low wear resistance. It's a very soft material. It's non-magnetic. It's good solderability, but due to the fact that it melts, has a poor chemical resistance. Um, that's, that's a disadvantage, of course, of tin. Although tin, unknowable as a steel, it gives uh, tin, it gives steel uh, not that good protection as zinc, for instance, does. It's very ductile, uh, seated, suited for the food industry, of course. Eh? In the early days, it was used for uh, all the canisters in which food was contained. And can be played in all temperatures. And the disadvantage, you can use it higher as 190 degrees because then the tin starts to flow. Uh, where it's used, on the right side, you see we use it for uh, connecting part tank hose. It's our parts which are only tin on the outside. Inside, is, the part is aluminium, and the inside is kept free. And it's used for the fact that when you tank at the gas station and you leave your, your tank hose in your car, you drive away, this is a safety part which will make sure that the hose is not takes your tank with them, but it's connect, disconnected. And under that, you see a template, which is map templated, and that's used for uh, flow systems. Also partial plating. Then we have silver plating, and silver plating, uh, well, it's too far. Silver plating is, uh, is done for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's a noble material. I know uh, that for some customers, it's not that 
uh, suited, but it's, it's, it has really good properties, especially in conductivity and especially high frequency conductivities. It's used for the housing antennas in all the antennas for telecommunication. Uh, the parts are silver plated due to the fact that the, uh, that the signals there, the, the, the signals come through with very high frequencies and silver is uh, purely good for that. Uh, immobility, you see it more and more. As Francis is also that silver, due to its nobility, it doesn't oxidize. And then everyone says, yeah, but it's getting black. Yeah, but that's not oxidizing, that's sulfidizing. Uh, that's one of the few uh, chemicals which nickel can't withstand, and that's sulfur. But oxidizing, it's not, it's a noble material. Electric, electronic industry of soldering, but you don't solder then the metal itself. Eh? You don't melt the metal, but you solder on the metal. That's possible due to the fact that silver doesn't oxidize, so you don't have an oxidized silver layer on top. And decorative industry, the jewelry, that's of course as snow. Another thing, and that's the, what we use it is for the anti fretting purposes. And anti fretting purposes, there we uh, silver plate nuts, and these nuts are used when you put, uh, for instance, stainless steel and stainless steel together, and you have some uh, vibrations uh, alongside a, 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 uh, a fast time, the stainless steel will, in principle, weld uh, to each other. You won't get it loose anymore. Putting a uh, coating in between, just like silver, which has a very low uh, coefficient of friction with easy turns, make sure that the fretting doesn't occur. Now, a lot of companies use these things, these, uh, these nuts. And I have a picture of those nuts. Of, uh, I have a, an example of those nuts. Perhaps you can share with uh, Arno. See, it's small, yeah, there you see. See, and those nuts, these are only plated on the inside. You had to, to develop a special special uh, electrolyte and a special machine for that, that only silver is plated on the inside. And I know also that uh, also Arsene Aldrich and a lot of other companies using them for connectors. And although it's silver on the inside, due to the, that connection, the, bolt, the nuts and the, the bolts are very easily separated from each other. And you see silver is only applied on the inside. And you ask, how do you do that masking? Yeah, that's a very special technique which we have to use there. We try to plate only on the inside. So make sure that there's nothing on the outside and we don't mask the parts by lacquer or something like that because that's not doneable. That's too, too much part. Uh, where this also used often is in the in the oil industry on the platforms, oil platforms. Uh, all those connectors are made on this uh, with this kind of nuts and bolts, uh, due to the fact that once in the several years they have to complete uh, renew all the connectors and that. And if they have all those stainless steel nuts and bolts. Um, principle melted together. You have, uh, they have a lot of extra work. Just turning them loose, uh, they save so many work and that's so many money. So they can uh, be better, quicker up and running again. Thank you, Adam. Going back in. Then it's used for reflection, light and mirrors, lights and mirrors. Uh, as I told you, the mirror where you look at, uh, it's, it's a real uh, one of the best illusions ever made. Uh, you think you look at yourself, but you look at a, a glass plate with a little silver layer behind. And chemis chemical uh, resistance in the laboratory uh, due to the fact that it's a noble material which not so solves easily. Okay. Now, also in silver, you can have matte to bright. 
The, easy to polish, very soft material, which can get to high polish. Uh, that's why it's also used in the early days for, uh, uh, for the, mess, uh, uh, the knives and the forks, that kind of stuff. High for reflection grade, mirrors, good solubility, but then only on the material itself and not in the material. No wear resistance, really ductile. Also this metal, if you put it directly on aluminum, you will have a big problem. Uh, so we have always make sure that you don't have that big uh, uh, battery in between them. So what you do is you put on a base layer and that you see on the, on the other side of the part, you see, and Arno will show you part two, uh, number four, four, Arno, please. These are parts which is used in the in, in the in the in the antennas industry for uh, airplanes, and these parts in very small holes. They have all have to be uh, coated with silver, um, but we put on a nickel layer because it's an aluminium part. If you put on uh, directly on the part, it's technical were technical possible. You would have a lot of corrosion. With a nickel chemical nickel underlayer, you have a nice coated, complete coated part. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you see better now. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, good. Um, good uh, corrosion, good chemical resistance. The only thing which is uh, affecting. So uh, silver is sulfur, and everyone says, "Okay, the silver is nice, uh, nice, nice layer, but it gets black." Yeah, that's due to the the uh, sulfur, which is in the end the SO2 uh, in in our atmosphere, and will turn uh, silver and uh, yeah, and during time into a black coating, and that coating is not influencing the the contact resistance or something like that, because the layer is really uh, thin, but it gives you a uh, surface, which is, uh, oh, I don't like that. I can imagine that. But it's not harmful for the functionality of silver, due to the fact that we are not working into the uh, decorative industry. It's for us mostly no problem. Then there are some other apple uh, metals and alloys which we which we are using, and uh, in principle we do copper, uh, usually uh, used as a base coat. Uh, we have gold, general used to minimize contact resistance, and we have uh, part two for that Arno, um, and and gold is is a typical layer. It's a very expensive coating, of course. And where I can use it best is when you want to have absolute no contact resistance. And if you want to have a, uh, the best co contact uh, from contact to contact, uh, conductivity, you can use gold due to the fact that gold is a very noble metal and doesn't oxidize. And that's why gold is used, especially in high demands, you, uses, you use uh, that kind of gold. We see it often in the air. In the, in the airplanes, we see it in the in the industry uh, where, where we go into space and that kind of stuff. There's gold, the uh, favorite uh, material. It's part two. We also have the combination of uh, gold cobalt, and then it's an alloy coating. And there you put some cobalt in it because if you use it for contacts, uh, it functions perfectly, only it's yeah, gold is a very soft material. And due to the fact that it's uh, soft, it wears very quickly. You can put some cobalt in the, in, in, in the, in the material, in the layer, so we get a, a principal gold cobalt alloy, and then you get uh, a better wear resistance. You have a nickel tungsten. Uh, that's, a moment, uh, that's a coating which we have uh, 
yet is in development, and we use it for replacement for Chrome 6 for hard chrome. And it has good results. It's now running in, in automotive cars for testing. And we see that it has a much property, a much uh, promising coating for replacing the chrome, but still staying on an electrolytic coating system. Tin nickel, where we use it against chlorides, a special alloy. White bronze, uh, where nickel is not allowed due to its allergenic uh, coatings. And, uh, replace nickel. And what we do is, of course, etching titanium for, for special process, etching copper. And we use combination coatings. And therefore, um, I have picture one, Arno. So picture one and picture two of part one and part two. Could you show us? Thank you. Yeah. What you see here, this is one typical gold to minimize the, in this case, it's used for chemical resistance. And here you see gold, which is used for uh, the combination code. What we do here is you see the part is chemical nickel plated completely. And then we only coat the inside of this part with gold. Uh, not only do for, to make it cheap because the layer thickness of the gold is just uh, as little, but just for the fact that here no gold is allowed. So just on those parts. As one, so one of the questions, of course, what uh, developers and designers has to cope with, how can I cope with gold and that kind of stuff? How can I mask those parts? Now, I would gladly uh, explain that, but uh, time is running out. So I have to go move on a little if you don't mind, but uh, that's something which we can do in the future in, 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 in another session to come over to, uh, to come go deeper into that. Thank you. Okay. Then chemical nickel. Chemical nickel is, is a coating which is, uh, which is totally different. Chemical nickel is a chemist, chemical coating and it's called an autocatalytic nickel process. Uh, on the right side, you see a drawing, a small sketch what's happening in a chemical nickel process. You see it's a, it's a very difficult, very complicated process. In principle, it is you have a solution in which nickel ions are dissolved. You put a reduction agent in that bath. Normally, it's uh, sodium hydrophosphate, which is used for that. And you put a part in the bath, a part which has a lower potential than uh, the nickel itself, than the nickel itself. What happens then when you put the part in? Uh, the part acts as a catalyzer. It starts a reaction. It starts a reaction that the uh, Reducing agent, reducing agent that falls apart. During that, it falls apart. It gives away electrons, and these electrons go to the uh, nickel ions, which are uh, uh, as 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 in, in the solution, and they form nickel as a metal. During that process of the the well, the, the uh, destroying of the the sodium hydrosulfate. Phosphor comes free, and this phosphor is also put a uh, build up in the layer. And what you so get is a nickel alloy containing nickel alloy which contains phosphorus. The big advantage of this process is it gives you a uniform layer uh, distribution. That means that everywhere where the solution is the same and the part uh, and the temperature of the bath is the same, your layer will be the same. That means in holes, in deep recessed places, on edges, so you get a very good layer uh, distribution. Due to the fact that phosphorus in that layer, we can increase the hardness of the layer. And that means increasing the hardness will also increase the wear resistance. A layer thickness up to 200 microns are just about possible.
use this for uh, machine fact manufacturing. That's one of the biggest uh, pathways to use, especially for corrosion wear resistance. And of course, to the fact that you have in a very, you can work with very tight dimensions. That means yeah, with the electrolytic processes, you always have your dog bone effect. You don't have that with chemical processes. Uh, that means uh, working in these days where we uh, really think about uh, layers about of our dimensions in microns instead of millimeters. It's, it's, it's good to have such kind of layer which can exactly uh, take over the dimensions. It's used also in semiconductor industry, but that's also a little bit of manuf machine manufacturing. There's no outgassing, uh, so it can be used there very good. Automotive, uh, you see on the right side, you see we should pins for the turbo motor from the automobiles. And thick layers, chemical nickel, 100 micron, and then even hardened. Or repair of machine parts where it replaces chrome, um, but it doesn't succeed to get the same wear resistance as chrome. Another thing is it's used as base coating for polymers and ceramic materials afterwards. Now, its properties are when you plate it, it has a hardness of just about 550 hardness figures. Uh, after heat treatment, you get it to 1,000, more than 1,000 figures. And that's the same hardness as hard chromium, but it's not the same wear resistance. Uh, you must bear that in mind. It has a good wear resistance, not just like hard chrome, but really good. A good corrosion resistance. The layer is conductive. Uh, that's special when you, you make rollers on which paper or something is transported because you have that static charging and with uh, electrolytic of with chemical nickel layers, you don't have that because they uh, they discharge uh, the paper. A good chemical resistance, only nitric acid is not allowed that, and other oxidizing agents will destroy chemical nickel. You can very accurate put on the layer thickness and it's plated on every base material, including aluminum and titanium. In principle, there are three different types of chemical nickel. You have the chemical nickel low phosphor. You have the chemical mid phosphor and the chemical nickel high phosphor. Uh, the percentages I put uh, there behind. And the chemical nickel low phosphor is mostly used uh, for wear resistance. That means with two to five percent phosphor, you have a real crystalline structure of your uh, coating and will give you a good wear resistance. Due to the crystalline structure, you have uh, of course, crystal, uh, crystal borders, and those crystal borders are suspected for corrosion resistance. So the corrosion resistance is less. When you take chemical nickel with high phosphorus, um, which contains 10 to 13% phosphor, you have a Röntgen amorph system. And that amorph system, Röntgen amorph system, gives you no crystal lines, so it gives you a very good corrosion resistance but less wear resistant because due to the crystals, you don't have that same wear resistant. And then you have, of course, chemical nickel, mid phosphor, that's typical Dutch uh, polder model. That's something from both sides. Uh, pros and cons, uh, chemical nickel, very good layer distribution. That's perfect in that case. You don't need any rectifiers. You don't have any burning on the edges. The coating has phosphor, so you can increase the hardness, and you need no hell, no no uh, extra any uh, measurements for getting your layer everywhere. Disadvantages are that you have to continuously add chemistry because you don't dissolve any anode, so you have to put in your nickel and your uh, hyperphosphite, your reduction agent, continuously. Your bot has uh, an indefinite lifetime. You can't work 25 years with the same bath. After, uh, say, two or three weeks or two or three months, you have to renew it bath completely. So that makes, together with the addition of chemistry, it makes it a much more expensive process as the electrolytic process. And it has a really low depos deposition rate. Uh, we talk about say max 20 micros an hour, but normal standard is just about 12 micros an hour. 
then that chemical nickel, you can cure that. Yeah? And just as I uh, told you, you can temper it and you make it, can make it harder. And that's done by, uh, when you look here on the left side, and the normal hardness of uh, what the chemical make about, DNC is the brand name which we use, uh, is just about 580 hardness figures. When you heat it up in an oven, after 230 degrees, you get uh, precipitation forming in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the system, in the layer. And after 260 degrees, it starts getting crystalline, turn the amorphous system into a crystalline system. And that raises the temperature of the, the hardness down to 1,000 uh, hardness figures. And that's done by using uh, temper ovens and with temperatures between 280 to 400 degrees. And beware, this will always have an influence on your materials. So if you say, okay, I want the chemical nickel on aluminum, but I want to have it hardness and I want it to have it in a short time, so say 400 degrees, uh, you can be sure that your aluminum has lost more than half of its uh, strength. And that's things which you have to take into account if you need if it's chemical nickel. Uh, heat treatment, uh, you want to increase the hardness, you have to make sure that you, uh, your material which you use is suitable for that. And also hardness increasing will result in a reduction in corrosion resistance. Then what you can do is you can uh, include PTV in your chemical nickel layer. So you uh, lower your coefficient of friction and the layer contains uh, PTV, permanent lubrication up to the end of the layer. You can put in silicon carbide into the chemical nickel layer, which gives you a more wear resistant coating that's even close to hard chromium. And you can put a bigger part of silicon carbide, and that's a special coating which we do in Eindhoven and which is used for uh, friction transfer. That means if I played a part with this coating, silicon carbide particles will stick out the coating. It increases your roughness, of course, uh, so it, it, it doesn't lower your uh, coefficient of friction, but it highers your coefficient of friction. But it has another advantage, is that when I put another part against that, the silicon carbide particles will be pressed into the material and will make a vast uh, connected connection with each other so that no movement is anymore possible. That's something which is uh, very, very valuable for some applications. Good. Then for the last piece, and a little bit running out of time, but um, for the last piece of my presentation, I like to talk about the design rules. And design rules start, of course, with what do we put on the drawing? And we, 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 if, if you have to draw and you, you have to know, you have to do uh, a an, an surface treatment on that, we have to know some things before we can do that. And one of the things is as plater, what we need is that we, of course, want to know the material and the surface condition. And that means uh, uh, how it's uh, how it's pretreated, how is it, what's done with it. For instance, uh, you have a part which is partly made of mill scale, uh, where the mill scale is there, and the part is uh, milled completely free. Now, these things are something which we have to know. We have to know if the material is heat treated. Also, for instance, laser cutting. Uh, when you st stainless steel make a uh, means of by laser cutting on the edge of your stainless steel, you will form chrome carbides. These chrome carbides will give you bad adhesion when you play them. Problem is you don't see them. So if you laser cut your materials, please notice, uh, notify us or put it on the drawing because then we know we have to etch it or treat it or uh, aluminum oxide blasting or something like that to make sure that the chrome carbides on those parts are gone. 
Then on the drum, it's important which section has to be plated, so where the functional part of the coating is, which section may be plated, and which section may not be plated or is not allowed to plate. And please uh, let that part of not be plated as small as possible, because that is the part which you have to mask, and which and there are a lot of methods to do that. There are holes you can use stops, you can uh, tape, you can use lacquer. There are a lot of uh, things to, to mask and to, to cover your parts. The problem, however, is that the bigger that part is that you don't play it, the difficult it will be become. And I have a, a, a nice example for that, and that's uh, part nine, uh, Arno. Can I show that, please? You see, this is a, is a part. It's special also for uh, uh, the flying industry. And this part is a, of copper, made of copper. The parts which you look at now, uh, the part is completely, uh, now is nickel plated. Then this part, which you see now, those red parts are free of nickel plating. And then uh, a small part, which you see in the holes, is gold plated. And on the other side, it's the same. You see there's more gold plating there. And you see in those small holes, those round holes, you see there's no uh, nickel and no gold plating. So that's one part in which so much masking is taking place. And uh, we, we, we said to customer, yeah, that's, that's much too expensive. So we gave him a price and then he said, he fell over a chair and said, ah, the price of making the complete part uh, without coating is not half of the price you ask for the coating. So, but that has to do with the demands you, you give. Hey, if you say, I want to have that coated, I don't want that part coated. It's, this is very difficult. So be in mind that when you can avoid masking, you will save money. And that's, of course, in the, I say not only save money, but also save time. Okay. So uh, surface treatment is, of course, necessary. The layer thickness. And uh, so uh, a question coming by very quickly. So dimensions is inclusive nickel uh, layer thickness. Normally not. Uh, the layer thickness is always added onto the to the dimensions on the drawing, or it has to be noted as dimensions count after plating. A roughness after surface treatment, but in principle also for surface treatment, and that's one of the discussions which we, you could get. Uh, you want a, a roughness of era say O2. And before that, you delivered 0.4. Uh, sorry, we can. We are not magicians, so we can't go with that. Uh, all the way around, that would be possible. So that could be the discussions. Then we have to you know because what you saw is that all the parts are dipped, uh, immersed in baths and in tanks, and some, and in some of these tanks, we make also electric contact to the baths. Also in chemical plating or in conversion plating. We have electrolytic processes. So what's important is that we have uh, a contact part. So where can we clamp the part as one, and where can we make contact with the part? That's, that's something which has to be on drawing because on that spot, you don't have your coating. The drawing them, of course, and where we have to measure the layer. Uh, in chemical nickel, that's no problem. You can do that in principle all over the part, so that's not the problem. But for electrolytic processes, which you have always a slight dog bone effect, how you how you make the part is important to know where do you want to have your layer thickness. So where do we have to measure? <laughs> then we have the delivery conditions, and yeah, now we have the two last slides. We have delivery conditions. How is a part delivered? 
And very important is the type and amount of oil in Greece. And that's something which you as developer, of course, and, uh, and designer uh, not have that much influence on. But I can, as the manufacturer, it's, it's, it's really important. Because uh, if you use silicon, silicon oils, uh, you can forget it. We also have that written down in our all our uh, uh, quotations, which we give to our customer. Don't use silicon oil because then you can plate it, and it's not only it's poison all of that, but there are also other oil and greases which are very difficult to cope with. For instance, uh, water soluble oils, something which more and more is in the green industry is coming to 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 use water soluble uh, fluids. But the problem with that is if it's soluble, it's always it it, sol uh, it solu dissolutes. It dissolves into the solution, uh, the, the, for instance, the cleaning solution, but it stays on in the, the solution. Also, the water, when you take it out, it's still there. That means it will uh, always make sure that you have problems with that. So if it's water, uh, we can mix, mix it with water, then, uh, then it's no problem. But if you have dissolved in water, it will be a problem. So water dissolving oils, Please not, or when it is so, please let us know. Uh, material conditions, uh, just uh, laser cutting, as I told you, heat treatment. Uh, beware if you use, some, uh, for instance, you do nitriding of a material as a one treatment and you want to plate it afterwards. Nitriding, iron nitride is a ceramic and it's not platable. So you have to remove that. So we have to, uh, aluminum blasted, so it makes uh, you have to disappear it again. So the complete nitriding process is gone. So that are things which doesn't which conflict. Local corrosion spots. Uh, uh, we have to etch the corrosion away, but you also etch your parts where the corrosion spots are not there. So we attack your material. Be aware of that. After cleaning, you can have drying residues. These rising residues often contain silicates well, because cleaning, uh, cleaning stuff which you use, cleaning chemicals uh, normally use uh, silicates. But silicates are killing for aluminum. If you have aluminum silicate, you can't remove it in your process and you will see it afterwards all the time. Uh, filing chips, burrs, all those things for mechanical production can give you problems because it will be built in into the coating and can break out. Grinding and polishing residues is the same. And one which is a very dangerous one and which normally you can't do much about it, only be aware, is tape residues. Uh, if you talk about axes and uh, rollers and that kind of stuff, they come in bulk, they are taped together you remove the tapes, you treat it there, you mechanically uh, make it in order, you send it to us. The tape is nice away, but if we pre-treat it, the glue rests, will make sure that your part is not covered completely. So that's something which we have to take care of. And then that's more important, of course, the design rules. That's what designers have more influence on, on itself is and that you have to be aware of. What, the first thing what I here have is, is of course small gaps on assemblies. And small gaps, and there's one also a question which came up yesterday, small gaps which uh, there I mean gaps in which you put the plates just cold together. You don't weld them, you put them together. If you put them together, what happens is that during the pre-treat, uh, during the manufacturing, there's oil on the inside of those plates. You put them together and you send them to us. Now, we put them in a degreaser to take out uh, the degrees and that bath is 50, 60 degrees and we move all the oil on the outside surface. Then we go further and then we come to a chemical nickel bath, which is 90 degrees. And what happens of course is when a bath is 90 degrees or is 50 degrees, the it's, it expands a little bit more. That means the gaps get a little bit bigger. The oil which is in between comes out in that bath and will make sure that on the edge of your gap, you will not have no plating or you will have corrosion afterwards or you get 
when you use stainless steel, you can have uh, corrosion in between, uh, just like pit corrosion, you get uh, a special corrosion uh, in between of those parts. Now, so that's very important. Better or welter parts or leave a, a space so that fluid a solution can run in between. It does has to be uh, a, a centimeter or something like that, but a millimeter or two will give enough uh, renewal of the fluid. Blind holes, also something. Blind holes, and for that I also have uh, a, a, a part, part eight, but I, we do that at the end. Oh yeah, you can do it, of course. That's, that's a big one. And that's a typical part, which is chemical nickel plate, which has all these problems inside. What you see here is you have a lot of holes in this in this part and all these holes uh, contain of course after treatment contain oil now, what we do is normally we clean those holes out but if you're starting processing them there's always a direction and that's something uh, how do you put your part into the bath you always have to make sure that there's no solution leave stay there in the holes and that uh, the oil which you know is coming out. So these parts producing is very dif difficult. And it means you have to make uh, a, a rack or a fixture that your part can turn around in the bath to make sure it's, the holes are uh, emptied, uh, nickel is coming in, but is also going out and that kind of stuff. Another risk on this part is and, and when you turn it to the other side, yes, thank you, is when you look uh, when you turn this part, uh, hang this part upside down, what you have here in the edges is that if you pass a little bit, uh, uh, say uh, on, on an edge of 15, uh, angle of 15 or 20 millimeters or uh, 20 degrees, you will have air bubbles there. The air will be trapped there, and trapping of the air there will give you uh, air, locks, air pockets. And these air pockets, will uh, uh, create an uncovered spots and these uncovered spots will later create corrosion and that's why in an early stage uh, if you make those kind of frames which are very difficult of construction and which have all kind of angles and forms take um, a small fo phone call to 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 the plater and ask them okay you know, i have here a part which i have to plate uh, I see a lot of edges, see a lot of possible air pockets. What can we do about that? Because it's quite easily to dissolve one extra hole in the center of where the air pocket will come and your air can escape and your part will be covered. So that's uh, something which you have to take in account. Then uh, deep holes, eh? you must take in account that deep holes uh, only uh, have the coverage possibility of two times, two to three times the diameter. So if you have a hole of six or diameter of six or seven millimeters, you can go in for 20, uh, 40 to 20 uh, millimeters depth, your layer is covered, uh, your product is covered, not more. The contact points, uh, make sure that contact points that are there. Yeah. Make sure that parts are degreased before welding, because welding uh, is mostly done on parts which are just manufactured and which is, has oil. And if you weld them, you can get oil in the, in, the, in the weld itself, and that will come out due to the plating or to the etching, and will can create also uh, bad adhesion. Restrict assemblies to one alloy, uh, there's every metal has its own pretreatment. If you use different alloys, different metals, if you have a problem. Parts which are grinded has to be magnetized because due to the grinding, they get magnetized and they get magnetic. And when they are magnetic, they pick up all the magnetic, uh, the metallic particles of the steel particles, which are in the complete pretreatment. So you start with a nice part and it ends when you go in your bath. We had a lot of particles on it, which got very rough uh, 
parts, with potent parts, and avoid those air pockets by adding exhaust, just as I meant. And what I meant is when you see those, uh, those blind holes, you see on the right picture, you see they're very good uh, example. Uh, the part is plated with gold, but due to the fact that oil is coming out of those holes, you get uncovered spots. And this is one of our bigger parts, which we a chemical nickel plate. And you see, this is the inside of the part, which has to be plated, but which has also a lot of possible trapped air pockets. So which has to be dissolved by uh, the wrapping technique. If we were in contact with the designer from this part in the advance, there will, will be no pro would be no problems. Now it's every time, is, is this okay? Yes, oh no, we have to be played. So that's uh, something which is very good. So a little bit over time, excuse me for that. And I want to go to the next page. So it's time for the question round. Thank you. Okay, Mati, thank you very much for your presentation. I followed it over time, but that's no problem at all because you gave us a lecture of about 40 years experience in this profession, which is a lot. So I think that our audience has inspiration for the next coming 10 years to study on. So thank <laughs> you for that. Okay, Before we close the session, there are, came up some questions via the chat. We will pick out two of them and all of them will be answered in, on the website later on. Maybe for you also just try to answer them shortly and more uh, elaborated answer can be put also on the website later on. So let's go for the first question from our audience. Do we have a table with max dimensions for the parts due to bar sizes? Yes, if you, uh, what I said in, in my presentation, sheet one, uh, mm -hmm. which is of course a copy because I couldn't put it there. I have uh, the PDF from this is uh, the possession of Arno and also Firat at ASML has it. And in that uh, table, you see bar sizes. So, and in the bar sizes, we mean the sizes for the part, which is possible in that bar. Okay, that's so second every question. We have another one. I'm looking for the next question, which is coming up. Is it possible to find the type of coating just with visual inspection? That would be nice. It is, is it possible to find the type of coating just with visual inspection? I don't know exactly what is meant here. Maybe it's meant that if you put a camera on your object and you want the kind of quality that uh, some program says, I know what this is, this should be the treatment because you want that result. Um, in my knowledge, not yet. Not, not yet. yet. Okay. But it's a good, it's a good idea. It's a good uh, thing to think about. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Then let's close uh, this uh, presentation. That just one last question from, from my side is, um, Matti, if you wake up five years from now, yeah. which technology is then existing, which is not existing today, but you wish to have today already? Uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things is what we do is, well, what I already told us is that alternative for, for hard chromium, uh, there's nickel wolf alloy plating, that's one of the uh, mm -hmm. things. Another thing is uh, being able to coat the more unknowable materials like magnesium and titanium on, on parts because we see a lot of uh, advances in that. And I think that's something which is worked on due to ionic uh, fluids, but it's not already there. And other thing is that due to the fact, and I think that's not only count for us, but it counts for every industry here, is lack of manpower. We have to go to uh, the, yeah, the roboting, uh, but what we are doing now at our site is that we use cobots and not due to uh, use for replacing our people, but uh, helping our people. That means if you have two people working together on a job, we now have one guy with a cobot doing the same job. And I think that's what, what I think the future uh, is, is really necessary. Okay, thank you for doing that. Well, uh, mostly if you are here in the same space in this room, I would like yeah. to thank you as a comes present, but I invited Martin Roos, manager of the high-tech platform, who would show the attention we'd like to give to you. He will now join me. And... <laughs> 
if Martin also is visible. Martin has yes. here over here a small present, which is, ah. before we will speak to you, is liquid. It's not, okay. mentioned to, it's not mentioned to put in a bath to put your parts in, but you should put it in yourself. Martin. Yes, thank you, uh, Matt. Matti, uh, thank you very much for this uh, interesting webinar. Okay. Um, as said, uh, we have a little, little gift for you. And uh, when you uh, finish with the, the, the positive COVID test, uh, I will, uh, <laughs> I will come, come, I, come to Albert and, uh, and give the, the, the gift okay, to you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is the right moment. I think that we all, all audience and we live in the studio, give you Mati, a big applause for your presentation. Thank you. And with us, the rest of the crowd and the audience. Okay, then we're going to finish uh, this uh, whole session. Thank you again, Mati, for your presentation. Um, behind me, you can see there is a kind of um, quiz we organized for you uh, to check your knowledge about this subject of today. And this quiz you can find on the website of the Northern Sharing Center. And you can fill in the quiz. There's a deadline to the 2nd of March because you can win something with that. I'm not going to explain what you can win, but it's a nice prize for the winners of this quiz. Take your time and maybe you can check yourself on what you learned from the presentation of Matthew Reinen. This is the quiz you can uh, go to in the website. Uh, we will give you also this link for this quiz in an email. You will receive all attendees will receive that with a link to the video registration of this webinar, uh, to the PDF probably of the presentation of Matthew Weine and also to this quiz. So you will leave everything you receive in your email, what you can do from now on with the information which has been broadcasted to you. And that's not all, because in the next slide we will see that was coming up. Uh, of course, another event but before that, I would like to thank some more people next to Matthew Weine. Of course, Karen Maus, Kai Peters and Martin Roos, who have been supporting this event in the studio and also up front in the organization. Thanks to them to make this happen together with the Knowledge Sharing Center. And of course, a lot of competence teams of ASML, because also they were needed to uh, provide the right content and to look for the right speakers to give you the information as given today by Matthew Reining. Thank you all. And then, like I said, there will be a new session, a new webinar on March 8th, it's quite soon, about non-destructive inspection of additive manufacturing parts by CT scan. A very, very interesting subject also to follow what's happening over there. It's uh, presented, presented by Thomas Kleinteich of PTW Proof Centrum in GmbH in Germany. So don't miss it and put it already in your agenda. On behalf of everybody, thank you for joining us on this webinar and I hope to meet you next time again. Bye. Thank you. Bye.